So it's life that's expressing in each one of us this springtime. And it's, it's life that wants to come forth out of that situation in your life that perhaps you gave up on. Maybe there's a dream in your heart that you said, ah, oh, I don't really need to go there anymore. Or maybe there's a part of yourself that you've maybe given up on. Or maybe there's a need to express some life expression within you that is being called forth by your soul to express in your life. And, and you've got to call it forth. It's not passive. This springtime is the perfect time for you to call it forth because that energy, that life is, is, is there. We can see it all around us. We can see it when we're, when we're doing our gardening. We can see it when we're, when we're sneezing with all the allergies. We can see it when we're, we're going through whatever we're going through in, in, in the beautiful day like today. You know, my son doesn't know it, but I'm going to steal his bicycle and go riding today. He's got a new bicycle. I'm going to ride it more than he. You know, but yeah, it's going to be my bicycle, right? But, um, but think about it. Think about life that you're calling forth. I call forth my life force energy. Together, I call forth my life force energy. Now, there was a man who was walking out of the service who came to me and he said to me, you know, only half joking. He says, you know, I come here to get entertained, not to be challenged like that. So apparently this is a challenging concept. So I want you to all reach, you know, on both sides of your seats, get that seatbelt and buckle it in, okay? Just buckle it in. It's got to, you know, because we're ready to move. We're ready to move. One of the most beautiful stories in the Bible about moving our energy and consciousness, it's not, we... Every story in the Bible is about ourselves and our hero's journey. And this one was about Lazarus. And Lazarus was one of Jesus' closest friends. And Jesus let him die. Jesus was uh, told that his friend Lazarus was dying. And please come and work and, you know, do some healing work on him. And he said, oh, he's going to be fine. No problem at all. And of course, he was going to be fine, but not the way people thought. Well, finally, Jesus waited till he was good and dead. And, and, and they, he said, oh, he's just sleeping. Oh, well, they said, well, if he's sleeping, uh, he'll wake up. No, I meant he's dead. <laughs> yeah. was, but something's going to happen here. It's very special. So they arrive, and the first thing that happens is that Jesus feels his feelings. He doesn't do a, a religious shortcut around his feelings. He lets himself feel them. So it says he's in the upheaval of the Spirit, and that he's weeping, and people even say, look how much he loved him. Because you say, well, it's Jesus, he's some kind of far off, whatever. No, human being, Jesus felt his feelings. And we must too. And if you want to get to whatever it is that's beyond or past those feelings, you got to feel them. And in order to do this great demonstration, which was raising Lazarus from the dead, he had to clear what was in the way. What was in the way? All of that stuff that he was holding, all that personal good necessary stuff, but he had to let go of what was in order to embrace what is to be. So then he tells them, roll away the stone. And they say, you can't be serious. It's been four days and it stinks in there. You've got a decomposing body in there. They really told him that. And he said, you've you got to see what's going to come next. So they roll away the stone and he says, Lazarus, come out. Now, if there's something in your life right now I want you to identify that needs to come out of the tomb, the moribund consciousness, that stuck place in yourself that maybe it's a fear. Maybe you've been holding on to something that uh, maybe it worked for you. Maybe it was necessary. You can call it forth. And it doesn't matter. And yeah, maybe it stinks in there a little bit. And maybe... You need to go through some feelings and letting it out. You need to, don't, don't do any shortcuts. Let yourself feel, but then get into this possibility. It's springtime. You can call forth the life from the tomb of your consciousness that has been stuck in a certain place. Which brings me to this wonderful plant. Now, this is not a root-bound plant. There is one in Betsy's office but I figured I'd kill it trying to move it in here. and She's not here today, so I would feel guilty. So anyway, I didn't want to do it. So imagine, have you ever had a root-bound plant? Have you ever had a plant that, that, that had been there? And it was wonderful. The, the, the pot was, the, 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 the limiting pot was very necessary. 
but then what happened? It, it grew to a point where there's all this growth, this little tiny pot, and when you finally break it so that you can you can you can repot it, you notice that it's there's hardly any dirt in there. It's all just roots. And do you feel like that root bound plant? Do you feel in a, some part of your life like there's there's no life possibility? You're 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 constricted. There's something you can call forth. It's like calling forth Lazarus from the tomb. You can get more room. A friend of mine once said, don't let your shoe determine the size of your foot. Don't let the pot determine the size of your plant. Repot yourself. Move yourself to it and feel the spaciousness and the energy and the vibration of the freedom that comes when you let go of what? Those old false beliefs. You know, I came into this lifetime with a whole bunch of rigidly held ideals, and they were good ideals. Good ideals. <laughs> you know, I wish I, I was going to go back to my office and get my ruler, because it's a measuring stick. It's a ruler. You measure everything according to those beliefs, you know. This is good. This is not good. This is what... And there's nothing wrong with having beliefs and having ideals, but it can be a constriction that that inhibits the aliveness of the love and the wisdom of your soul that needs to take precedence. There's something in your soul, there's growth that needs to happen that is inhibited by the size of the pot. And the, it was a good pot, wasn't it? Be, how many times have you repotted plants? In tens of thousands? Yeah. So, 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 so how many times have you repotted a plant? That old pot was necessary, it was good, but then it becomes unnecessary, unhelpful, and you gotta let it go. I gotta let it go, together. I gotta let it go. And you move into a new possibility. And 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 you're not you're not limited. So identify a, a rigid or a false belief or a fear that you want to let go of. You know, I when I was a little kid, I had two traumas. One at two and one at three. When I was two years old, I got uh, accidentally pushed off a second story and landed on my head in concrete. Oh. I had carried a scar here till I was eight. It explains some things. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and and they said if I'd fallen just slightly differently, I would I would have died. And uh, and it, I got over it just fine. At least that's what they tell me. But uh, but. But I was scared of heights. I was so scared of heights that when I was about eight years old, we crossed, we walked across the Golden Gate Bridge and I actually walked down in traffic. I wouldn't mind if a car hit me, but I wasn't going to look over the edge of that thing, you know? And so, and it was debilitating. You know, I lived in a part of the world where there's a lot of heights and a lot of cliffs and a lot of things, and I couldn't enjoy any of it. So I made a concerted effort to get over it. I had a friend who had a a father who was a, a bridge tender or, or the Carquina Straits, 350 feet straight down. I had to climb a ladder on the outside, up five stories, and I cussed every word you could imagine out of my fears. As Jesus, as it says in the Bible, Jesus was in his upheaval of spirit. You know? And I had to let the upheaval of spirit out. You know? You let the feelings out. You don't shortcut them. You gotta let them out. I gotta let it out. Together? I gotta let it out. And then the next thing that happened was uh, I was uh, I spent a month in the in the fire department. I've told that story, and I had to climb up on. And you know they flunked me out, but I did everything they told me to do. But I, but about uh, the, I had to go five stories up with fake smoke coming out. And and the final thing was when I jumped out of an airplane and I passed out because I was so afraid. But I'm telling you that did it. I have no fears of heights. I have just a little bit. Yesterday, Dallas Trailer, God bless him got on the ladder and changed this light up here that was out, preventing me from having the joyful experience of doing that, because I love doing it. I love that little bit of whatever. Okay, now, and, and then another thing happened when I was on my third birthday, and I remember that I was a little kid, and, and we we're, were in a swimming pool, and I guess nobody was watching me, because I knew that swimming pools, I was three, but I was smart enough to know that swimming pools gradually get deeper, so I could just kind of go until it reached here, and I was safe. No, this was that swimming pool that was like this, and then a big step, and then like that, and I went like this, and whoosh, and we're looking up thinking, I'm going to find out what it's like when you're dead. Whoa. I mean, I really thought that. I wasn't really scared. But apparently, it, uh, they, somebody saw me, and I was rescued, and I was fine. But I was so afraid of deep water. It took 
I had to take the same class in swimming class three times. I was afraid to go in the deep water, but I faced it. I overcame it. I had to deal with it. Now, you don't have to overcome every phobia that you got, every fear, but there's something in your life, and it's probably not a fear of heights or, 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 or water, but it's maybe a, a fear of expressing yourself, a fear of, of, of being the person that you could be, the, the, the potential of who you are. And, and, and you, can, you can face it. You can move through it. And sometimes, sometimes in your life, Things aren't working out very well, and you get moved to a different track. Buckminster Fuller once said that sometimes if you're feeling blocked, it's because you're on the wrong track and God's trying to move you to another track, which reminds me of a story of a woman that I know Mary Beth knows named Peggy Bassett. I graduated from ministerial school, and I moved to Huntington Beach, California, because all the Unity churches in that area had failed. And uh, there was, it was, so that meant that it was open territory. And so I was going to open up a unity church. And I was, I, I tried everything. I tried to get places to meet. I tried to get connected with people. Nothing worked. Finally, I went into meditation. I asked, why? And I got, because it's not needed. I didn't know what that meant. What I didn't know was that at that, that exact time, during those weeks, the, the Religious Science Church in Huntington Beach with Peggy Bassett as a minister, which has very similar beliefs to unity, that they were, they were a little group of 40 people. She'd been there seven years. They'd grown to 80 people. And they got big enough so that it didn't fit anymore in the small facility they're in. And they're going to go out and buy themselves, uh, a ch build themselves a church. And so they went to the, the bank. They got the loan for their church. And t t to move into temporary quarters while they were building it, they moved into a shopping center that had some uh, empty storefronts. And they went into the, the place and, and they started holding services. They went back to the bank and they talked to the loan officer. And the loan officer that who had proved their loan had quit. And wasn't there anymore. And the new loan officer denied their application and they couldn't build their church. And her whole world came crashing around her because now they had no church home. And now they're scurrying around trying to figure out what to do. Just like I was scurrying around trying to find out what to do. And... And something funny happened. While they were doing that, shoppers who had never set foot in a church started coming to this storefront thing because they'd see it there. And they grew to 250 people. And they realized, my gosh, this is working pretty well. So they just stayed there for years. And they grew and they grew. They got to the point where they had a couple thousand people in their church. Then they decided to build a church and they shrunk again. But anyway, that's the rest of the story. But, but she... But she and she told me that she says it was it was that they were on the wrong track. They were doing they were doing what they thought they were supposed to do. And you know what? It's good to move in a certain direction. It's good to have a pole star, a north star that you aim towards. But you're never going to hit the the pole star. You're just going to use it for direction. And so when it doesn't work, sometimes as Buckminster Fuller said, you're on the wrong track. You get moved to another track. And me. And a, the, a church opened up, it would have been the last church I ever would have gone to, but it was the only church that was open, it was the perfect church for me. When you are on, and when you are on your spirit-guided path, you are a chip for God, and you let God bet you and play you wherever God wants to. I am a chip for God, play me, together. I am a chip for God, play me. That affirmation came to me a uh, little over 20 years ago, right after Jane Hart challenged me and asked me, what do you want? And I said, I want to serve God. She said, don't you want to, want to know God first? I said, yes. And I made a commitment in my soul to live my life from another place. I no longer wanted to see my life through the lens of my ego personality self, but I wanted to see my life through the lens of my soul, my higher self, the Christ in me. And so right after that, of course, everything changed. And it was like, what's going to happen? And it all looked very much upheaval, upheaval, upheaval. And the affirmation, and I don't know if she shared it with me, Jane did, or whether I came up with it, but it was, I am a chip for God, play me. Together, I am a chip for God, play me. Imagine that roulette table. And instead of you trying to figure out where to put it, you let go to divine mind, to this mind of God that knows where to play the chip. Not so that you get what you want. Ah, Winning becomes something different. What is it then that you want? What do you want? You want the highest good for all. 
And you also want spiritual growth. And that is not necessarily what makes you comfortable. And so, I am a chip for God playing me. It means a willingness to surrender to something that is greater, something that's more, something that will grow you in ways that were unexpected. And Rosalie just, just graduated from this wonderful experience. It's not what she had in mind, but she had a wonderful experience of those two years at Harper College and did all these triumphant things that I just end up bragging like a silly parent. So I won't tell you about them. But she did all these wonderful things because, because of this the, the, the being a chip for God. And the kids got to experience all their incredible education. When you, when you let go into the Spirit, you become a chip for God. But you've got to generate the energy for it with the energy of desire. Desire is what generates the energy of celebration and participation and joy and enthusiasm. You've got to desire to, to what? To grow. You've got to let go of that, that little stuck safe place that says, if I could just get everything to stop, I'll be okay. It's that resistance that says, if I could just stop, I'll be okay. But, but the answer to that is that flexibility and desire. Flexibility that you're open to the highest good, whatever that is, I'm a chip for God, play me. And desire that you really want that spiritual growth more than anything else. I love what Charles Fillmore said about desire. He said, deep desire is essential for spiritual growth. It is the onward impulse of the ever-evolving soul. Deep desire is essential for spiritual growth. It is the onward impulse of the ever-evolving soul. How do you generate that desire? Maybe with an affirmation like, I am a chip for God, play me. Together, I am a chip for God, play me. And letting go into, you know, if, if it's a, if you're, have you ever gone rafting? You know, sometimes, I've never gone really rafting, but sort of rafting. But, you know, go for the white water. you got this little little thing, and you, there's the white water. Go for the white water. Go for that which, which, which really nurtures your soul. Rosalie was saying, hey, I just put it out there, and I'm going to just go, and I'm going to see what shows up. Letting go of the rigidly held pictures and what Rosalie's found out is that, that that's when the good stuff shows up. That's when the unexpected stuff shows up. That's when you end up in the shopping center and that's the best thing that could happen to you or whatever. But it takes a desire to grow. Now, I've had people who studied a little Buddhism who say, well, the Buddha said don't have any desires, but he didn't. This is what Eknath Iswaran said about that. He said, the Buddha sometimes is quoted as saying that desire is suffering. But a more accurate translation is that selfish desire is suffering. In fact, it's the source of all suffering. Desire itself is simply power, neither good nor bad. Without the tremendous power of desire, there can be no progress on the spiritual path. There can be no progress anywhere. The whole secret of spiritual transformation is turning your selfish desire into selfless desire, transforming personal passions into the overwhelming desire to attain life's highest goal. And this is not repression, it is transformation. The willingness to see things through the lens of what does the soul want, what does the soul need, rather than what the personality ego wants. You know, one thing I noticed is that when my personality ego is very unhappy, often my soul is really, really happy. Does this make any sense to you? That, that when my ego self, my personality self is, is happy, my soul may not be too pleased. But when my ego personality self is going, oh, I don't like this, my soul is going, yay team, go for it, yes, you know? Do you know what I'm saying? And this is about the time when people start glazing over. So, so, so it's, it's, it's being willing, it's being willing to engage with your whole heart, with your whole self, and to get into movement, movement and vibration. You know, I had a picture in my mind of sitting down on the tack and this going, hmm, I wonder what this tack means. What does it mean? No, get up into movement. Get off the tack. You know, when, when you have a pebble in your shoe, don't ruminate over, I wonder what this pebble in my shoe is all about. No, get, take it out and move forward. Keep putting yourself into action. Life is action. Life is movement. 
I've been doing something called Qigong. Uh, um, one of my meditation teachers uh, told me to get a, a, a DVD, and I, I do this, these exercises. And what they're about is that it's movement around a center. Movement around a center. And life itself is movement around a center. Your cells, movement around a nucleus. Uh, an atoms, movement around a nucleus. Uh, the solar system's movement around the sun. The galaxy moves around a center. The whole universe spiraling movement around a center. You got to get into movement. You got to get into vibration and place some part of what you believe into movement. Identify is there some fear or is there something that's you're withholding yourself from? And I don't mean some earthly ambition necessarily. I'm talking about something of engaging with life and making it part of your life. But you've got to generate that desire and that energy and 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 it takes a little bit of a little bit of oomph. I love this quote about oomph. It's from Paul. And I think it's in Romans. He says, all the runners, you know, Paul, Paul was an announcer in the Olympics. And I mean the Olympics. They they really think he was an announcer in the Olympics, you know, the real ones back two thousand years ago. He says, all the runners in the stadium are trying to win, but only one of them can get the prize. You've got to run in the same way, meaning to win. All the fighters in the games go into strict training. They do this just to win a wreath that will wither away. We do it for a wreath that never will wither away. This is how I run, intent on winning. This is how I fight, not just shadow boxing. Having been an announcer myself, I do not want myself to be disqualified. You put yourself out. And, you know, what do you do? You ask for some help. Put your energy out there. Say, okay, I need some help here. And sometimes I say, I need bonehead level help because sometimes you're dealing with a mind that's, that's kind of slow. So I need some help here. And you'll get some help. Jesus talked about this. I love this, this wonderful parable. He said, what do you, what do you think? Suppose one of you goes to your friend's house at midnight and you say, Friend, I want to borrow three loaves of bread. A friend of mine was on a trip and just came to my house and I don't have any food for him. Suppose your friend should answer from the inside, Oh, don't bother me. My door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I'm not going to give up and get up and give you anything. Well, what then? I tell you that even if you don't give up and give you even if he won't give up and give you the bread because you're his friend, yet he'll get up and give you everything you need because you're not ashamed to just keep on asking. So I'm saying to you, ask, you'll receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Everybody who asks receives. Those who seek will find. The door will be open to anyone who knocks. And he says, you know, that if, you're, if you're willing to put out the energy, put out the energy in your inner prayer, in your inner life, you will get backup. You will get support. You will receive that which you need to receive. But it means being willing to get out of that stuck place, that place that says, you know, uh, this is all I can really expect. You know, how, you know what happens? When you put this energy forth, you get back up. You put out a little energy and you get a whole bunch of energy that comes in behind you to back you up. You, you, you ever notice investors? They're willing to put a lot of money into somebody who's got something going for them. You know? And you get the cosmic universal energy going, if you got something going for you, you got a little desire, you got a little seek and you shall find, you will find that energy, that vibration will back you up and will move you forward in a powerful way. Well, I got a couple more things. Oh, one thing I want to share. If you want to get something in motion, Lynn created this. It's called Vow to My Enlightened Self. It's on the table right outside on your way out. And it's got some action steps you can take and just kind of little things. You see, a lot of people are intimidated when I start talking about this stuff because they think i got to do some big deal. It's not. You just do little things. A few little things. And you do them consistently and you'll move with them and they'll move with you. So pick this up. This is a powerful thing. So let's just move into this, into this time and just open our hearts, open our minds and just, just pray the prayer, God, I am your chip. Play me where you will. I'm willing. I'm willing to be played in the place where I'm of greatest benefit and service, but also where I have my greatest spiritual growth. And I'm willing to let go into and throw myself on the universal flow. I'm willing to go 
for the white water. I'm willing to move my energy, generate my desire, make my commitment. And if I don't know what that is, I just say, God, I am your chip. I am willing. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I'm showing up. My commitment is strong. Thank you, God. So it is. So beautiful. So we take ourselves into this time with a spirit of flexibility and life. Spring is spontaneous. Spring is flexible. Spring is life. And if we want to experience the flexibility and the spontaneity of life, we need look no further than our own physical bodies that express that spontaneous life as the energy coursing through our blood, our, our bloodstream, that life force energy. It's no accident that Jesus likened the energy of life, life itself, to blood which courses through our bodies. And so I'm going to ask that you just get in touch right now with the feeling of your heart beating. Where do you notice it? Do you notice it in the palms of your hands or your fingertips? Can you feel your pulse spontaneously in your wrists or your neck or your chest or your heart itself? Just notice a life flowing through your body, the energy. This is life. This is energy. I am this life and energy that flows, that knows where to go and what to do. It spontaneously generates, heals, guides, Take a moment to notice the other evidence of life, the breath. With each in-breath is spirit, spiritus, literally meant breath in Latin. I can feel the spirit, the tingling in my body as I watch my breath. become aware of the life force within me as I once again notice the pulse of the flow of the blood in my body. And I get in touch with the spontaneous life of God as I get quiet enough and notice my breath and my circulation. Whatever is happening to me, spirit is flowing through me. Wherever I am in my life, I have a living, flowing, circulating spirit. Expressing is my circulation and my breathing, but moving around, all around me. Life is energy 
flowing in spiral motions around a center, and I am that energy. All life, all life flows, and I am grateful that I am part of that greater flow, and I let go into that flow, and it is, it is who I am, and so it is. So we're taking as our offering statement today, I am giving in a spirit of joy and I'm receiving abundantly. Together, I am giving in a spirit of joy and I'm receiving abundantly. And silently. And again aloud together. I'm giving in a spirit of joy and I'm receiving abundantly. And so it is. Amen.